Who are you? My name is Edmund, and I'm the Crown Prince of Telestia. You couldn't tell I was royalty by the deluxe accommodations? Who are you? You're a prince? Why were you put in the dungeon? It's a long story. I come from Telestia, a city on the outer edges of Abarak. A few years ago, our water supplies started to dry up. Balthazar, the royal necromancer, studied the problem and discovered that the Colossus was failing. The magic that sustained us for thousands of years was ebbing. We knew that our time was limited. We boarded everyone onto our ships and set sail for the Fire Sea. None of us had been there before, but Balthazar's ancient maps indicated a route. The trip was perilous. What's more, our ships hadn't been used for thousands of years, since we first came to Telestia. By the time we arrived, we had lost many of our people, including the king, my father. Therefore, I became my people's leader. Our intended destination was this palace. We had never seen the palace, or met the dynast that ruled us. Instead of arriving on his doorstep with a few thousand refugees, I decided to leave them in a warren of natural caves that we discovered, and come here as an envoy. I felt that Clytus and I could speak and decide where my people could live. I arrived at the palace alone. He greeted me with open arms and invited me to a banquet. My people have been living on withered corn grass for months, so I must admit that a banquet sounded appetizing. During the meal, he began to question me. The questions were innocuous at first, but became more probing and less veiled as Clytus continued. He asked military questions. What was the size of our forces and where were the troops bivouacked? Suddenly, he was sounding less like a benevolent leader and more like a king bent on eliminating any threats to his power or strains on his kingdom's food supply. Just as I stood up and announced that I wished to take my leave, a sharp pain doubled me over. Clytus simply looked over and smiled. He explained that the wine in my cup had been poisoned, and that after it killed me, he would drag the answers from my corpse. His guards brought me down here and locked me up. Now, I'm just waiting to die. What exactly is this Colossus? The Colossus is a stone spire infused with the magic of the ancients. It heats the world and slowly melts the Celestial Sea, a huge body of ice which feeds water throughout Abarak. For some reason, it is failing. Our water supply has dried up. It doesn't make any sense. According to Balthazar's books, the Colossus was designed to last forever. He hoped to examine the Colossus and perhaps help to mend it. But now we'll never get the chance. By ignoring the problem and focusing on his own petty self-interests, Clytus is sealing our world's doom. Where is the Colossus? The Colossus is in Clytus's palace. It lies at the center of the ancient catacombs which run through the palace's foundation. The entrance is right across from this dungeon. Although Balthazar's books state this, they don't show the path through the catacombs. It's said that only the dynast knows the way. Where are your people now? They are safely tucked away in the secret caves along the edge of the Fire Sea. Clytus would give his eye teeth to know where. If somehow we managed to escape, we would still be stranded here with no way to cross the sea. I've got a ship. If you show me where they are, I could transport us there. The chances of escape are slim, but it's nice to know that we will have a way across the sea if we do. How long have you been here? Not long. Less than a day, surely. I fear that I can't hold out much longer, though. The poison has ravaged my system. It appears, for some reason, to be working faster on you. Perhaps you received a larger dose. I doubt that you have more than a couple hours left. Why didn't you send some nobody as your envoy? Seems like a dangerous job for a prince. Everyone under my rule is important. There are no nobodies. I would risk myself before I would send someone else into danger. Can your people pose a threat to the dynast? They sound like a bunch of farmers. We are mostly peaceful folk, but we have some reserves of dead fighting troops. That doesn't matter much, though. While Clytus holds the scepter of rulership, he could turn my army into dust before it even gets into position. Let's back up a step. Suit yourself. Isn't Telestia quite a ways from here? Yes. It was a long, perilous journey which claimed my father. It's rather hard to accept that it was all for nothing. My name is Haplo. I'd shake your hand, but I'm kind of tied up right now. 
Very nice to meet you, Haplo. Any enemy of Clytus is a friend of mine. Let's talk about something else. All right. I don't have much else to do. Why do I feel so sick? That would be the poison. You've experienced Clytus' special welcome. It appears that he likes to invite strangers to a banquet, extract whatever information he can while pretending to be friendly, and then poison them. After they die, he resurrects the corpses to have them answer any remaining questions. Don't feel special. It happened to me as well. What happens if he decides he wants to keep his victim alive, or someone accidentally drinks the poison? Is it too late, or is there an antidote? There is an antidote, though it's unlikely we'll ever get our hands on it. I overheard some of the guards talking about it, when they were planning to sneak wine from the banquet room's bar. The bar contains a variety of liqueurs in a wide array of colors. As you're aware, the poisoned wine is in a red bottle. The antidote is in a clear bottle. It's useless to even think about it, though. Even if we could get out of these chains, we'd never make it past all the guards. Why did this Clytus lock us up? To give the poison time to kill us. When we're dead, he'll resurrect us and get all the information he needs. No way am I telling him anything, even after my death. <sighs> I'm afraid you'll have no choice. Part of the process of resurrection ensures that you'll serve the living to the full extent of your ability. You'll be glad to answer any questions he might have. Do you know any way out of here? In fact, I do. One of Balthazar's old books showed a secret passage out of the palace's foundation. If we were unfettered, I might be able to find that passage. What's Clytus' story? How'd he get to be Dynast? That is a story. I only know the parts of the legend that Balthazar found in his reading. I guess we don't have anywhere to go, so I might as well tell you. According to the legend, our ancestors created this world and populated it with the weak races. Those races continually warred with each other, so our ancestors decided to sleep until everyone began to get along. Presumably, when that happened, our ancestors would wake and rejoin the new society. I guess they made Abarak a little too hostile for the weaker races. The heat and impure air were killing more of them than their petty wars were. So they banded together much sooner than anticipated, and roused our ancestors. They arose to discover that the world was killing the races instead of nurturing them. They also found that there was nothing that they could do to save them. It required all of their magic just to keep themselves alive. So they selected a handful of members from each race, placed them in the sleep chambers from which they had just risen, and waited for something called the Interconnection. The books were a little unclear about this term. All they say is that it would make life much better on Abarak. Clytus I was a member of the High Council at that time. One day, he arrived in the Council session with a powerful magic scepter. With it, he convinced the others to found a monarchy, with himself as the dynast, the ruler. The line has continued unbroken, as far as I can tell, to this day. Each new son takes up the scepter of rulership and becomes the new dynast. The man who tossed us in this dungeon is Clytus the Fourteenth. It's said that his scepter can turn a man to dust in seconds. No one wants to confront such raw magic, so he remains in power. Clytus the First did do something right, though. He introduced us to necromancy. It's only by bringing back our dead that we have been able to stay alive. He even sacrificed his own personal servant as the first experiment. What happened to the rest of the weaker races? They died. There was no way to save them. It must have been horrible to watch them die, completely helpless to do anything. Sounds like he's the product of a little too much inbreeding. I know nothing about Clytus' specific lineage, but madness is a symptom of inbreeding, and he is certainly displaying that. Does the Council still exist? No. Clytus I disbanded it when he created the monarchy. My ancestor was a member. This amulet I wear was a badge of his office. It's been in my family ever since, and I wear it proudly. You really think necromancy is all that hot? It's hard to question something that is such a fundamental part of your life. But Balthazar has raised some interesting points. He believes that we should be concentrating on rediscovering the old, lost magic arts. If we used our magic to make our lives better, we wouldn't need to bring back the dead. To be totally honest, Seeing my father resurrected into a shadow of his former self was chilling. 
I don't look forward to dying myself, or to the inevitable result. If Clytus' scepter can turn a man to dust, why does he bother with poison? He still needs information from me. I assume the same is true for you. If he destroyed us, the information would be lost as well. If he kills us with poison, we are undamaged. Then he can resurrect us and demand the information he wants. Since the dead always serve the living, we'll have no choice but to tell him everything. You mean that if Clytus didn't have this scepter, he wouldn't be in charge? I would challenge him myself if I could count on a fair fight. My claim to the throne is as strong. My ancestor was also a member of the High Council. These are all pipe dreams, though. His scepter would make dust of them and me.